ASTM C39 is the standard test method for determining the strength of cylindrical concrete specimens. This procedure is used to determine the compressive strength of cylindrical concrete specimens such as molded cylinders and drilled cores. This procedure is limited to concretes with a unit weight greater than 50 pounds per cubic foot or 800 kilograms per cubic meter. Moist cured cylinders should remain in the moist condition until the time of test and then they should be tested as soon as practicable after removal from moist storage. During the period between removal from moist storage and the actual testing, the use of any convenient method to keep the cylinders moist is permissible. However, all cylinders shall be tested in the moist condition. The diameter used for calculating the cross-sectional area of the test specimen shall be determined to the nearest 0.25 millimeters, or 0.01 inches, by averaging two diameters measured at right angles to each other at about the mid-height of the specimen. Here we are going across the top of the cylinder for viewing purposes only. The number of cylinders measured can be reduced to 1 in 10 or 3 per day, whichever is greater, if the molds come from a single lot and consistently produce diameters that are within 0.5 millimeter or 0.02 inches. The machine used in this procedure shall have sufficient capabilities and capacities to provide rates of loading of 0.25 plus or minus 0.05 megapascals per second or 35 plus or minus 7 psi per second. Verification of the accuracy of the testing machine is required. The testing machine's accuracy should be verified within 13 months of the last calibration or upon original installation of the machine, immediately after any relocation, and immediately after any repairs that may have affected the force applying load system. Verification should also take place after any adjustments have been made that affect the operation of the force applying load system, and whenever there is a question of accuracy. For loads used in the compression machine, the percentage of error should not exceed 1% of the indicated load. The machine must be power operated and capable of applying a load continuously and without shock. If the machine has only one loading rate, it must meet the prescribed loading rates indicated in this specification. In this case, it can be provided with supplemental means of loading at a rate suitable for the verification of the machine. This supplemental loading may be power or hand operated. The testing machine shall be equipped with two steel bearing blocks with hardened faces, one of which will be a spherically seated block and the other a solid block. The bearing faces shall be at least 3% greater than the diameter of the specimen being tested. The spherically seated block shall be equipped with a ball and socket. When loaded to capacity, the spherically seated block should be so designed as to not deform. Furthermore, the curved surface of the socket must remain clean and oiled. To maintain surface specification, the lower bearing block should provide a readily machinable surface. When placing the lower bearing block on the platened, the hardened face should be face up. Now that we've talked about the specifications involved in storing the cylinder as well as the specifications of the machine, Let's now move on to the actual testing of the cylindrical concrete specimen. We want to align the axis of our specimen with the center thrust of the spherically seated block. 
just prior to testing, verify that the load indicator has been set to zero. We can now apply the load at the prescribed rate. Remember, the load should be applied continuously and without shock. A higher rate of loading is permissible through the first half of the anticipated loading phase. When the cylinder does break, we want to record the maximum load, the type of fracture, and we want to calculate the compressive strength by dividing the maximum load by the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. There are many other things that should be recorded when you break a cylinder. For instance, the length and diameter. And don't forget to adjust the strength if the length to diameter ratio is less than 1.75. Record the ID number, the age of the specimen, any defects in the specimen, and any defects in the cap, because many things can affect the strength of concrete. It has been proven that the size of the specimen will have an effect on the ultimate concrete strength. The shape of the specimen, batching procedures, mixing procedures, the age of the concrete, the temperature, moisture conditions, and curing conditions. All these and much more can have an effect on the strength of your concrete. And that is why ASTM C39 is the cornerstone of quality control and quality assurance programs in the concrete industry. It can be used to measure the quality of mix proportioning, mixing procedures, placing procedures, and even be used to measure the effectiveness of concrete admixtures. Now that we have a for a lack of a better expression, foundation in ASTM C39, let's move on to a detailed performance review. First, we want to remove our cylinders from moist storage, but again, we want to keep them moist until the time of test. We now want to check the cylinder using a bullseye level or some other means for perpendicularity to 0 0.5 degrees. Determine the diameter of the specimen by averaging two diameter measurements at right angles to each other at about mid-height of the specimen. Once again, we are measuring across the top of the cylinder for viewing purposes only. Next, verify that no individual diameter differs from any other diameter by more than 2%. Now, wipe clean both the lower and upper bearing block as well as your test specimen. If using unbonded caps, center the specimen inside the retainer ring. We can now carefully align the axis of the specimen with the center thrust of the spherically seated block. Now, set the load indicator to zero. At this point in the performance review, some host laboratories will ask a third party to run the controls of the machine only because they're more familiar with that specific machine, while the examinee gives verbal commands on the requirements for the standard. Now we can tilt the movable portion of the spherically seated block gently by hand so that the bearing face appears to be parallel to the top of the test specimen. At this point, if unbonded caps are not being used and the specimen meets the requirements of plainness of 0.05 millimeters or 0.002 inches, the examinee can move on to applying the load to the test specimen. However, if unbonded caps are being used, there are other steps which must be taken. For unbonded caps, we want to apply a load to the specimen of less than 10% of the anticipated specimen strength, and then check that the axis of the cylinder does not depart from vertical by more than 0 0.5 degrees, and that the ends of the cylinders are centered within the retaining rings. We can now apply the load continuously and without shock. 
at a rate of 35 plus or minus 7 psi per second during the latter phase of the anticipated load. This is because a higher rate of loading is permissible through the first half of the loading phase. Now, as the cylinder begins to reach its ultimate load, make no adjustments in the load rate. Continue to apply the load until the load indicator shows that the load is decreasing steadily and the specimen displays a well-defined fracture. We can now record the maximum load carried by the specimen. We also want to note the type of fracture pattern, and we want to calculate the compressive strength of the specimen and report it to the nearest 0.1 MPA or 10 PSI. When noting the type of fracture, the type 1 fracture is reasonably well-formed cones on both ends. It has less than one inch of cracking through the caps. The type 2 fracture has a well-formed cone on only one end and vertical cracks running through the other end with no well-defined cone. Type 3 fractures are columnar. They're typically vertical cracking through both ends with no well-defined cones. Type 4 fractures are diagonal fractures with no cracking at either end of the cylinder. Typically, these breaks need to be tapped with a hammer to distinguish them from the type 1 fracture. Type 5 fractures are considered side fractures. This is where there's chipping at the top or bottom sides of the cylinder. This is a very common type of fracture with unbonded caps. Type 6 fractures are similar to type 5 fractures, except they leave the ends being pointed. Now to calculate the PSI, all we need to do is take the maximum load applied to the cylinder and divide it by the cross-sectional area. This will give us the compressive strength of the cylinder. So therefore, as an example, if we had a total load of 62,500 pounds applied to the cylinder and the total cross-sectional area was 12.56, which is just about the cross-sectional area for a 4x8 cylinder, providing that the 4x8 is a perfect 4x8, then we would wind up with a compressive strength of 4,980 pounds per square inch. And finally, if you are asked to convert the PSI to megapascals, we take the PSI and we divide it by 145.0377, which gives us 34.3 megapascals, reporting to the nearest 0.1 megapascal. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're completely comfortable with all these calculations, then feel free to move on to the ASTM C39 quiz. However, if not, you can visit our Blackboard session, which is the next video. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to conclude ASTM C39, standard test method for determining compressive strength of cylindrical concrete specimens. And just kind of look at it, say something to Mark like, doesn't look that doesn't good, look that right? Yeah. Hand it to Mark, and then Mark, just put it down on the table. Pick up the thing, put it on there. Now stop, because I gotta zoom in, okay? Okay, and go ahead and Do me a favor, put your other hand on top of that bar.